Okay, let's get started. And uh, I think hopefully more people will trickle in here as we as we continue. And uh, we'll at least start the introduction and then we'll move on to the, the main event here. So I want to welcome everybody. This is a another one in our series of the 125th anniversary virtual education series. Uh, we've been able to go through all of the different departments within the Earth and Mineral Sciences College. And now we're back to, you know, in my humble opinion, the best one, which is meteorology. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm um, Kevin Shea, and I'm on the board of GEMS, which is the Graduates of Earth and Mineral Sciences. It's an organization made up of uh, alumnus from all five departments within EMS, uh, 2007 graduate of meteorology, and currently work at a company called Jupiter Intelligence that does climate change analytics. Um, but enough about me. Um, let's get to our speaker today. Uh, this person that we're going to be having uh, speaking is is definitely needs no introduction. Uh, we're joined by Dr. William Brune, Distinguished Professor of the Department of Meteorology and Atmospheric Science here at Penn State. Uh, Dr. Brune earned his BS in physics from Southwestern at, at Memphis and a master's and PhD in physics at John, Johns Hopkins. Dr. Brune spent 10 years working on his postdoc and being a research associate fellow in chemical physics at Harvard before finally challenging himself and coming to Penn State and becoming an associate professor in 1993. In his time at Penn State, Dr. Broom has served the Department of Head for 15 years and is now a distinguished professor. Um, I received his list of achievements before this, but it was it would have taken our entire time. So just to name a few things, uh, Dr. Broom, 12-time recipient of the NASA Group Achievement Award, is a fellow with AGU, AMS, and the American Association of, for the Advancement of Science, He's a recipient of the NASA Henry J. E. Reed Award, and most recently, the recipient of the Paul F. Robertson Award for EMS Breakthrough of the Year. So I'm very happy to introduce today, Dr. William Broom, who's gonna to speak today about his work with thunderstorms sparking unexpected amounts of hydroxyl. Dr. Broom, over to you. Thank you, Kevin, for that very nice introduction. And thank you for inviting me to do this. I'm, I'm really, uh, please to get this opportunity. And so this really is a newsflash. This is a very new discovery that we made uh, based on looking at what happens with thunderstorms and, and the extreme amounts of the atmosphere's cleanser, which is hydroxyl, which I'm going to talk about briefly. One thing nice about this field is it's joining two different fields, atmospheric chemistry and atmospheric electricity, which speak very different languages. It's been really fun to, to connect with them to, to do this work. Okay, so let, let's look at what, what hydroxyl is. Basically, hydroxyl makes everything happen in the atmosphere. It's very simply made by uh, ultraviolet light from the sun and ozone and water. And basically water gets broken apart and you get an OH and an H. And so OH is very reactive. It wants that H back. And so it'll react with almost everything in the atmosphere including smelly gases. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean the pine smell that you get when you're in a forest or automobile exhaust or, or, or evaporating gasoline or any other pollution, asphalt, any of those things are smelly gases it reacts with. And what is the result? It makes haze, ozone and particle pollution, which we see here. And it's responsible for 3 million deaths per year globally. So it's a really big deal. In addition, OH reacts with SO2, which of course, results in acid rain, which if you lived in the Northeast, that was devastating in the 1970s and 80s until it was gotten under control by controlling smokestacks. And then finally, it reacts with methane, which comes from cows and other sources. And it is the only way methane gets out of the atmosphere is by reacting with OH. So as OH changes, it changes methane, which is a powerful greenhouse gas and has a big effect on climate change. So OH is a big deal. Now, it's the number one cleanser. And this, is, this is, seems paradoxical. It's a cleanser, but at the same time, it leads to pollution. And this leading to pollution is on the way to sort of cleaning the atmosphere. And so it's hard for people to understand it, but it does both. And both of them, that is the, the methane that it gets rid of, as well as the ozone and particle pollution, are all parts of, of essentially climate-sensitive gases and, and atmospheric composition. So, so they all factor in into climate change as well as human health and ecology. Okay, so what are we talking about here? Well, everyone knows you, you have mostly uh, nitrogen and oxygen in the atmosphere, some water vapor. Those are the main, main things we have. And so if we have lightning, this is 30,000 30, Kelvin 
inside this lightning bolt here. That's the temperature. So it breaks apart everything. And so it's been known for 50 years that it breaks apart the nitrogen and the oxygen. And then it cools so quickly that it recombines in this thing called NO, nitric oxide. This is the same stuff that comes out of your tailpipe and it's the same stuff that comes out of power plants that, that is causing pollution. And so that's been known for a long time. The discovery is, is that it also breaks apart water. Now, it's been known it breaks apart water, but everyone said, well, water recombines so fast that you never see it. In a microsecond, it's gone. And, and what we see is, no, no, the OH here, which is the hydrogen and oxygen, and the HO2, which is two oxygens and picked up the hydrogen there, those things exist for a seconds or a few seconds after the flash has happened. This is very new and no models predicted this at all. No one had this right. Okay, so what do we have here? What's the situation? Well, we have the normal process as in every model, climate models, every model has this process in it. And then we have this new process that's been going on for forever, but no one has been accounting for it at all. It's totally unaccounted for. So the question is, how is this really impacting these and how in the future is going to impact as lightning increases as, as climate change raises uh, global temperatures? So there's a lot of questions here, all tied into this very important process of, of atmospheric uh, cleansing by OH. All right, so how do we make this discovery? Well, we had this fantastic study called the Deep Convective Clouds and Chemistry Study over the central US in 2012. A long time ago, I know. Some, some of you might have been, I don't know, maybe at Penn State even. And so the idea is we want to look at what's going into the storm and then it's being processed in here because there are a lot of cloud drops and lightning and then what gets spit out the top. And we're very interested in what gets spit out the top like that will make ozone because up in this region, ozone is really a major greenhouse gas up here right near the stratosphere, right at the upper troposphere. And so we took the NASA DC-8, which is a flying laboratory, and we flew down here and we sampled what was going in. And then we spiral up next to it, and then we would fly through the anvil here. So here's the wind blowing the, the top of the thunderstorm over. And we fly back and forth in the anvil and look at what happened at the output. You can't fly in the core of the storm because the updrafts and downdrafts would, would take the plane out. At the same time, there was a thing called a lightning mapping array. And all it is is essentially radio receivers that are tuned to a frequency that's not in a commercial band. And what it does is there's an array of about 10 or 20 of them. And by looking all together, they can pinpoint with great accuracy both the, the timing and the location of every single flash that's going on within the storm. So it's a fantastic combination there. Okay, so we were, we were based in Salina and then we'd fly either Colorado where they had these things or we fly to Texas, Oklahoma, where they had them, or we fly to Alabama, where they had them, depending on what the forecaster said. So here we are in Salina on a nice sunny day. Here's the NASA DC-8 here. Here's the NSF uh, Gulfstream 5. And here's the DLR Falcon, the German aircraft that was flying around. And here's the group that was there at the time. And I'm right there. That's me. And this thing hanging down from underneath the, the, the DC-8, that is the inlet to, to our instrument that measured hydroxyl right there. Okay, so what, what's it like when you're flying? It's, it's fantastic if you ever get a chance to do it. It's a fantastic thing. And so here is essentially a cumulus convection that hasn't gone all the way up yet, but it's developing. And here's the anvil because the wind's blowing this way. And so, so when, you, when you're flying, and I was in the jump seat in the cockpit because I needed to communicate with the pilots immediately, you can see it gets really dark in there. And they're going, uh, what do we do now? And so, but they know how to do this very safely. And, and they did a great job. Okay, so what did we see? We saw these huge Hox signals. The Hox is a combination of OH and HO2. It's the two of them together, and they kind of cycle really fast, so we kind of think of them together. But we didn't believe these signals because, you know, they were pretty extreme, and we didn't believe them. We thought maybe it's some noise or something in the instrument. So we analyzed the normal data. So here, here's, the, here's the big spikes here, and they go way, way up, way above the screen here. Here you see, this is normal HO2, and normal OH would be a line, if we drew it, it would be a line right at the bottom here. You couldn't even see it. And so this is what we were looking for. And so well, we're gonna analyze this first and then we'll turn our attention back to these huge signals that we don't understand. And so, so we analyzed this and sure enough, the models do a pretty good job. Even when you're in clouds away from this stuff, they really have a really good job of, 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 of figuring out what exactly the measurements are. They, they really simulate it well. So that's actually encouraging. 
And so you notice also these big spikes are only in the clouds, only in the clouds. And so we, we, we developed a new method to look at things in the five years, and we could then look at a very high time resolution, and the signals were real. Everything about them looked real to us. Okay, so, so what do we do? Well, is it due to lightning or not? That's the question. So I had this great undergraduate intern, summer intern, Patrick McFarland, and he actually coordinated with the lightning mapping array people, and he, he was able to take the data and actually produce these plots. And so here's, this is three different hours of a flight through a, 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 a thunderstorm anvil. And here's the anvil here being blown this way, and you see over time it moves this way with the wind blowing. And then here, if you look at this, this is flash extent, which is really just the amount of flash. And so here's, here's the flash extent. And you see, here's the yellow. This is where there's a lot. This is the core of the storm. That's what it's seeing there. And then here's where the DCA went. So here's flying down low, and then it's cycling up, and then it's going across. So every time you see the yellow and the red, that means extreme amounts of OH and HO2. And so as we go back and forth, you see here's the normal amounts, extreme amounts, normal amounts, extreme amounts, going back and forth. And then we cycled around and went behind and sampled the, actually some smoke and then came around and sure enough, Nick, the, the, the storm that was developing below that and sure enough, it got high again. So this sort of says, hmm, they are correlated pretty well. So, so here's, here's a little video of what it's like to be in that aircraft at that time. So let me, let me just uh, start this here. Okay, now look carefully because it's gonna come fast. Everyone see that? Okay, let me do it again and look look down here, look right down here, right about that time there, right about this time here. Okay, just wait, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. You see that? That was less than 1 26th of a second, one frame, and it was lightning right in front of the airplane. Just amazing. Okay, so what, what do we see? So we can take we can take that information and combine it with our, our measurements of OH and HO2. And here's the flash happening right here. This is in seconds. This is 1610, 1620, so on and so on. And within two tenths of a second, we see the first big spike. And then it goes down, and then we see another big spike about a half second later. So this confirms that lightning makes extreme amounts of OH and HO2. And it lasts way beyond the flash because all the models said, oh, it's gone in the flash, you'll never see it, but we see it. Okay, so this is what we call extreme hox or L hox, and that is hox that lasts beyond the flux. It's made by these. Okay, so this is great. We got it. But here's, here's ice water content, which many of you might know. This is essentially where the clouds are. This is where the clouds are. And so what we see here is the orange here is really where the LMA says, oh, there were flashes. And so you see that's here and here and here. And so it seems like it's doing a pretty good job. But if we look in detail, this is a detail over here of this over here. We see that yes, some of it is in flash, but some of it is not. Okay, well, you know, back to the drawing board, right? It's not correlating perfectly. What's going on here? How are we gonna deal with this? Okay, so we got thinking, well, maybe there are things like subvisible discharges that the, the lightning mapping ray just can't see because they're too weak. It's known that in lightning, it's gotta start with something and it starts with weak discharges. And then they grow and amplify and then you get lightning. And we also know that all of these things here that are terminating, they're ending in weak discharges. And we also know that around the core of the storm where this is just two centimeters wide or so, there's also weak electrical discharges. So they're all over the place. Okay, so it's okay, well, so this looks pretty good. Maybe there are these subvisible discharges, but correlation is not causation. We need to prove it. How are we gonna do that? So here's where we go into the laboratory. And so we have a Tesla coil that's used for musical acts. Interestingly, that's their main, that's what they mainly sell to. And so we're able to make high voltage, 10, 20,000 volt sparks like this, which is smaller than by a lot than a lightning flash. And the amount of current is, you know, many, many orders of magnitude less, but it's still the same temperature. And so it's mimicking everything just on a much smaller scale. And we're doing it in a tube where we can lower the pressure and the temperature so we can look at the whole atmosphere all the way up, all the way up to where the ambles were in the clouds, which was when the pressure was about four times lower than at the surface. And so we're also able to make subvisible discharges and they're silent and you can't hear them. Uh, my hearing's not very good, so that didn't make any difference to me. But for my graduate students, oh, yeah, no, I, I, I can't hear anything or I can hear the others all the time. 
But we had an RF antenna, radio frequency antenna, uh, antenna with this system, and we could detect it on that. So we knew it was happening. And then we had very high speed measurements of all of these things, OH and HO2 and NO and ozone. And Gina did hundreds of experiments. Okay, so I'm gonna show you one here, and this is from Sparks. And so this is water vapor over a range of water that's in the atmosphere. And then here's different pressures in the atmosphere from 970 to 360 hectopascals. And so sure enough, we see OH and HO2 called LHOX here, OH and HO2, the same range as the DC3 measurements were in exactly the same range. In the same amount. And we also see it's not very dependent on water when you get above a certain value. So what this tells us is this stuff has to be made everywhere at all parts of the atmosphere, not just up in the anvil, but everywhere. And so this means it's got a lot of applications and we need to think about it very carefully. Okay, so what about these subvisible discharges? Well, here's the DC3 range, and sure enough, every this spark is on this side, and everything on this side is before it sparked. And you see, sure enough, you make very high levels of this of this of this uh, extreme OH and HO2. And so this is really a good indicator that even subvisible discharges, which are very weak, have the ability to make this. And we notice also that the no NO is made, NOx is NO plus NO2, none is made because it needs the high temperature. And all OH and HO2 need is for water to be broken apart, just like the normal processes in the atmosphere. So it's possible, in fact, very likely, that all electrical discharges make extreme amounts of OH and HO2. That means, think of them, everyone. Okay, so in interviews, I've been asked, how does this affect me? It's usually not put quite that crudely, but that's basically what the question is. And the answer is, it's a surprising discovery. We don't know all the implications yet. But here's what we know. We know that OH is a big deal for climate, human health, and ecology. It really is a driving force in the atmosphere for all these processes that we think of in terms of pollution and in cleansing. Also, there's no predictive model that has anything like this in it. They just don't. They, they never thought about this before, and they just don't have it because they all thought the OH just went way too fast. And it's very hard to, impl imp you know, to implement something into a model that lasts for two seconds at most and is very localized, but on the other hand, produce thousands and thousands of times of the OH of the rest of the atmosphere and therefore has a much bigger impact. It's a hard thing to do. Okay, so here's another thing we know. We know that there are about 1800 thunderstorms going on all the time. And you see here in red, these are where they're going mostly. And it's mostly in the tropics and subtropics and Africa is really a hot spot, but Florida and Texas are really hot spots for the US. And then of course in Southeast Asia as well. We also know that there are 50 to 100 lightning strikes per second. And we know that in the Arctic, there's a recent study that shows in blue here, the increase in lightning that's occurring in the Arctic above 60 degrees north, and it matches perfectly with essentially the temperature increase in the same region. So that means things are gonna happen. And, 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 and globally, likely there'll be an increase in frequency and intensity of lightning, and it's gonna have an effect on essentially the, the cleansing ability of the atmosphere. So based on our DC3 data, which is seven flights of about two hours each going through ambles, we were able to estimate that anywhere between two and 16, but probably on toward the higher side of global OH actually comes from thunderstorms already. What's gonna happen as lightning increases? Probably there's gonna be more. But at the same time, that means there's gonna be more production of pollution of ozone and particles. So you have two things working. You're getting rid of the methane, but on the other hand, you're creating these short-lived greenhouse gases, ozone and particles. Okay, so the conclusions are, this is a new discovery. You know, the flashes and subvisible discharges making extreme OH and HO2. I have a colleague from, from my small college who is a professor at, at uh, Ole Miss, and he's an expert in lightning. And he goes, oh, these subvisible discharges you're telling me about, they're really interesting. What are they? How do they work? So they don't even know. They don't even know. So this is a whole new ground even for them. And likely this is gonna have global, regional and local implications for current and future atmospheric composition and climate on all these scales. Because as I said, all these discharges can make this no matter what they are. Okay, so in reality, we don't know enough yet because we have such limited data set uh, even though we have good lab data, we have it's too limited. And so there's work to do. So we want to do lab work that, for instance, puts clouds and look to see how clouds affect what we see. And, and we want to do more ample aircraft flights because we went 
in the high plains and look at those clouds, but they are very, very different from the tropical thunderstorms in, 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 all, in many, many ways. And so you may be different results there. So we really need to go to Florida in order to see what's going on there. And also we wanna look for extreme OH and HO2 and other discharges. And this is something we're actually already starting to do. And you can imagine we're seeing a lot. Uh, and finally, in order to sort of project what's gonna happen in the future because of this, in terms of atmospheric cleansing, we need a better global model parameterization based on measurements. And so that really will allow us to sort of project into the future. And so with that, I'll say thank you and, and take any questions. That's great. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Brune. That was a fantastic overview. Again, and just uh, I mentioned to people who are attending, if you want to drop questions in the Q&A box, please do uh, at this time. We had a few questions submitted ahead of time that maybe we can uh, get started with. Um, some of them a little bit more general, um, just about OH. There were some questions, uh, a question that came in for the presentation about, uh, you know, you referred to, I think it was on the second slide as OH is an atmospheric cleanser. I think you talked a little bit about that, but can you maybe go in a little bit more about uh, what you meant by referring to it as an atmospheric cleanser and uh, what, what OH does in terms of maybe removing pollutants and aerosols from, from the atmosphere? Yeah, so, so um, <clears throat> because OH is so reactive, having lost the hydrogen, water that lost the hydrogen, they will react with almost anything to get that hydrogen back and go back to water. And that means you put something in the atmosphere and OH is gonna react with it. And so if for whatever reason, we, we had no OH in the atmosphere, the, o, the atmosphere would be filled up with every sort of chemical that you can imagine. It would just fill up because in most cases, there's nothing else to remove it, nothing else. So OH is a cleanser in the sense that it is the main way that most chemicals essentially are, are, are or react with OH and they're put in a form that allows them to either be rained out or to be sticky and stand on the surface. And so without OH, that wouldn't happen. It would just stay in the atmosphere and it would be a very bad atmosphere for us to have. That's really what we mean by cleanser. It essentially does all that. But in the process of cleansing that initial step when it reacts with these things, it sets off a chain of reactions that go to make ozone and particles. Okay. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's a great explanation. Um, it, it, just adding to that, I guess there was a question that was related. May, may have just answered part of it, but you know, when it's talking about OH removing pollutants from the atmosphere, can you talk a little bit about maybe the chemical reaction that's going on? Okay. Uh, yes. And so, so, so basically, what's happening is, you know, if you if you let say so, a hydrocarbon is essentially what we're made of. And what is what is a lot of the, the chemicals are, they have a hydrogen and a carbon. That is that simple. And so basically, if if you allowed OH, and so methane for is an example, a carbon and four hydrogens, right? And so what, what OH does, it pulls off one of those hydrogens and it makes what's left reactive. It goes to water, but it makes what's left reactive. And if you let that process go all the way down, eventually you would end up with CO2 and water because you have carbon, you have the oxygen in the atmosphere and the, all the carbon will go to CO2 because that's the most stable and all the hydrogen will go to water. But in the middle of that, you make other chemicals uh, like uh, formaldehyde, which people may be familiar with. And those things are stickier and those things are easier to take up in, in, in more water soluble. So if you have cloud drops, they can get into the cloud drops and then be rained down to the ground. And so, so some of them get intercepted on the way to going to carbon dioxide and water, and then they get rained out and cleaned out by, say, sometimes just by depositing on the surface and going into our lungs, you know, like ozone, for example. And so all these processes are sort of happening. And, it's just, and so depending on the chemical, it can be a really, really, really long chain. And methane's pretty easy. That's only about eight steps in order to get the CO2 in water. But all the others can take a long time. And then some of them, you know, of the, of the bigger ones, like the stuff, you know, pine smell from forest, that actually gets, gets very sticky and, and forms particles. And then the particles, of course, we breathe them or they fall on the surface or they get rained out. Okay, no, that's great. 
Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for the explanation. Uh, another question that we had uh, come in was uh, around the, uh, the downstream uh, implications. So you mentioned about how this finding can be used potentially in, uh, in maybe improving and looking at different like climate modeling and there are different areas where this finding can be incorporated. What, what you know, as someone who works in that industry, I know that it, that climate modeling, right, takes there's a there's a long stretch of time that's required to kind of run a lot of those models. So, what what is the process of you know when new findings like this come out, getting it into the academic community, starting to incorporate it into you know whether it's a climate report or start getting it included in some of the climate modeling that's done. Yeah, you know, what what does that process look like? So this is an excellent question, and uh, and so. And uh, you know, it could take a while, but the, 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 the kind of short first is, you know, uh, my, my experience is that, you know, when you have an observation like this, that's really, really just way out of what you expect and what the models just cannot get at all. Uh, you know, the, the observationists, the first thing they do is suspect the observation. And the modeler also suspects the observation. So, so that's the first step is to get by that. And so, uh, you know, I think we've made a really strong case here for, for this. And we going in the lab really was crucial as well as combining with the LMA and whatnot. All the pieces fit together really nicely. But, you know, it is having, we are having a hard time making traction with this in the modeling community because it's so new and they don't know how to deal with it. You know, how do you deal with something that just lasts two seconds and, and, you know, it's so sporadic. It's a very hard thing to put into mm -hmm. a model. And so my, my, one of my colleagues, one of my former graduate students, Jing Shu Mao, who's a professor at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, he left me doing, you know, laboratory you know, and, and field work and went up to Harvard and did global chemical modeling. So he actually tried this. He tried to put this in. And it's a really hard thing to do. And so in, in predictive models, I think there's, people are still waiting to, to, to see about, you know, how are we going to handle this? Because it's, it's very, very, very difficult because it's so fast and the time scales and the spatial scales don't match very well with a global model that has a grid of one degree by one degree. Mm. So, but, but I, it's going to happen eventually and, and, and it has to because it's, it's an important fact. Right. Yeah. And then, um, you know, with, is there additional work that's required? I mean, I think you mentioned there is more additional work to be required, but is it, do you have to do, uh, sorry, look in like different regions and areas to see if there's a variation in the finding at all? Like, I know you've done a, you know, we've done a great amount of work now, but, you know, is there, is there a chance that you could see variation in this finding if you were to do this same level of experiments in other parts of the world? So, so uh, as I said, the, the, the tropical convection, deep convection, it's very different from high plains deep convection. And part of it is because the cloud base in high, high plains is very, very high. So where the cloud starts is very, very high. And it's much, much lower in the tropics. So the structures of the storm are different. The lightning is different. It, the lightning there is less frequent, but a lot more intense. And so how does that affect this? Because you know if this is happening mostly in everything that isn't the core of, of, of the lightning, the, the flash that comes down, but all the other little parts and all the streamers that are coming down, then you know you gotta think about how that's gonna affect that. So if we could fly through an anvil in Florida, for example, which has plenty of thunderstorms, then we could take a look and see, is this giving us really a different result than we would get? And if you have that, because most of the, of the lightning is in the tropics, then we would have, you know, we'd be a little bit more confident that we really have nailed down, uh, you know, the relationship between the lightning that can be observed by satellites like GLM and, and some of those and actually what we see. Okay. All right. Well, that that uh, that has fulfilled all of the open Q&A questions that I have on my side. So I'm going to ask one more time, maybe look for the audience, see if there's any more questions. And maybe if, if no others in, in 30, uh, 30 seconds or so, we can probably wrap up. So any, oh, we, we have a question come in. Uh, so uh, Stephen asks, is there any evidence in the observed data over the past decades that the OH generation process you've identified might explain uh, uh, the discrepancies regarding the concentrations or behavior of various atmospheric constituents? Yeah, you know, this, this is, this is a, another excellent question. And you know, when we thought about this, we thought, well, maybe we should be able to see you know, from these lightning flashes, we should be able to see changes in some of the gases that we know are very reactive with OH. They were also measured on the NASA DC-8. The problem is, is that 
that you know that air has come up from the ground and been processed and so if you look at it versus looking outside of where the lightning is you know that could be very well be different because it came from a different environment and in fact in ozone that's very very often seen you know the the the, the thunderstorm pushes up against the stratosphere and ozone gets wrapped around the edges and so how do you separate that getting wrapped around the edges from being produced in the storm so so that's sort of a, a, a really sort of a, a major problem. Now you would think that maybe you can look sort of regionally and whatnot, but the, but once again, you run into the same sort of problems is you do not have a control for this and you cannot sort of nail down exactly what it would have been in the absence of lightning. One of the problems is, is that the, 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 the chemical transport modelers, is, which is the large global uh, chemistry models, which aren't really, by the way, very well coupled into the, the climate ones, I should say. I, I meant to say that earlier. That's a real problem for the chemistry. And, and, and as I get together with my chemistry, atmospheric chemistry colleagues, we lament the fact that climate modelers aren't paying enough attention to the chemistry, which is a major driver of what's going on. And so this is a, this is a sort of a big problem that we, we are discussing. And, and now I think the climate models are starting to include more and more reasonable chemistry. Uh, maybe because of pressure from some of my colleagues, I have no idea. But the point is, is that right now they have a problem is they have too much OH. They don't want to hear about this at all. <laughs> they don't want to hear about it at all. On the other hand, you know, uh, talking to my colleague, uh, uh, you know, he was sort of passing me back and forth with a, a, a working group that they have. And they were going, oh, we, we found this error in our code and it changed the amount of OH that we think by a fact by 10%. And so we're talking about something on the 10% level, which is really important because if, if methane's lifetime is 10% longer, that means there's going to be 10% more of it in the atmosphere. And that's a big deal. And so, so there are a lot of problems. So this is, this is, they're still coping with other things and they, I'm not sure they really want to try to cope with this yet. Great, that's, uh, thanks very much. And the, the person who asked the question, thank you as well for answering that question. Yeah, welcome, Steve. <laughs> All right, uh, last call for questions from the audience. Okay, I don't see any further. So um, what I will say is I just want to thank, you know, Dr. Brune, thank you for giving this presentation. Uh, it's extremely interesting and, and informative. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, being part of the virtual education series. I want to thank all those who attended. Um, we will be posting this um, online for people to access at a later point. And uh, just want to thank everyone for for participating and uh, coming and hearing this this presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank and thanks for having me. Great. All right. Thanks, everybody.